So anytime our people are spending time doing something, we've got to understand the ROI of that labor expense. And for us, um, actually, with the help of Gallagher and Josh a few years ago, really set out on understanding how much we were spending watering cattle, how much productivity loss we were experiencing with our cattle because of water proximity and you know amount of waters per pasture, pasture systems. And, and we quickly learned that we were, um, the implementation of a little more uh, advanced watering systems really had a, a really strong ROI for us that we could really make sense in terms of what our labor cost was. And there's Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversation podcast, where we talk about all things related to ranching by connecting you to peer ranchers and industry leaders to improve the profitability of your operation and your lifestyle. Now, if you are looking for a community of ranchers, sign up for my monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Mind events are mastermind events for ranchers. You join a Zoom link and you sit down and have a conversation with other ranchers and industry leaders about specific topics that help you improve your operation and face the challenges that we face as an industry as a whole. Now, if you want immediate ranch management advice, go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com slash newsletter and sign up. When you sign up, I will send you a free PDF with 22 ranch management tips from the ranching gurus who have been on my show and poured out their knowledge for all to hear. With that, be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram by following Cattle Convos. You can connect with me there or you can go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com to find anything you may need. I'm excited to meet you and let's get on with the show. Well, to start off, thank you both for being on the show today. I'm excited to have you on here and to connect with our listeners. So what I would really like to do is have each of you introduce yourself. So Kyle, would you please start and talk about what your role in the beef industry is today? Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me to be here with you today. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity. Uh, My name's Kyle Mayberry, I'm Director of Agriculture for the Biltmore Company in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I know some of your listeners may have varying um, knowledge of the Biltmore. It's certainly a a large tourist attraction um, in the southeastern United States. Um, Biltmore is uh, the largest home in America, Um, was founded and built by George Washington Vanderbilt and opened its doors in 1895. Um, uh, to really establish this oasis country estate um, in the mountains and Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. We keep that legacy alive today. We're 8,000 acre property um, that of course still houses that um, uh, massive home um, that is the center focus of our business. Um, And then my role at Biltmore is the Director of Agriculture. We have a very diverse agriculture operation. Um, We're a cow-calf producer. Um, we're a Berkshire pork producer, we're a Dorper uh, sheep producer, um, and then we're also in the row crop business pretty extensively as well. Um, my role in, uh, in above, up and above agriculture involves the natural resource management, um, some of our pollinator habitats, a lot of different aspects. And then, of course, a big part of it is agritourism. Um, at Biltmore, we have around 1.7 million guests um, come onto our property every year. And so we get a really unique opportunity um, to engage um, our guests uh, about the food that they eat, how that food's produced, um, and tell that story in a really, uh, in a really fun way. Um, and then, of course, we have America's most visited winery. Um, we have several, um, nearly 100 acres of viticulture, um, and we, we grow a variety of grapes where we produce um, wines here on the property that our guests get to enjoy. So that's the, the big picture view of some of, some of what we do. Sounds like you have your hands full with a lot of diversified, well, livestock species, but just diversified ag in general. So that's pretty cool. And I'm glad to have you on here. How about, how about you, Josh? What's your role in the beef industry today? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Shay, for having me today. Um, My role is with Gallagher Animal Management. I'm the territory manager for North Carolina and Virginia. Um, My role specifically to beef is helping producers with their livestock fencing needs, 
as well as their livestock watering needs, as well as their scales and weighing needs. Um, also, EID is included in that. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work with producers like Kyle here who we have today, um, but all kinds of producers from small to big, from commercial to purebred. So. Well, awesome. And for those of you listening today, we're going to talk about watering systems. So I'm excited to talk about that and gain both of your perspectives. And so we know that fresh water is really important to cattle and how they perform and just their overall animal health. But what's one of the main challenges you see producers face with their watering systems, Josh? So one of the main challenges I see <clears throat> is convenience of watering for one thing, um, how they're currently doing it, whether it's hauling buckets out to every day or using a little float valve in a Rubbermaid tank. Um, so convenience is a huge factor that plays into your watering needs on your operation, um, as well as, you know, simple quality of life. What do you want to spend your time doing? Um, do you want to spend your time hauling buckets or hauling tractor buckets full of water out to the field? Or would you rather be doing other things that you may view as more important? So um, I think that's about it. I kind of rambled there for a second, but... <laughs> no, I think that I think you really hit the nail on the head there because it does matter kind of on what your operational goals are, how much time you have and what's available to you in your environment. Kyle, would you talk a little bit about um, kind of how your watering systems are set up and what that looks like on your operation? Yeah, sure. So we, um, you know, we're like a lot of beef systems, um, especially in this part of the world um, and, and you know, Western North Carolina, the Southeast in general, where we have um, predominantly a cow-calf operation. Um, you know, we, we are unique, I'll, and I'll talk about the uniqueness a little bit and why maybe we have uh, taken the approach we have in watering systems. Um, we are um, an 8,000 acre property. We have cattle at the furthest point of each of those um, boundaries of that 8,000 acre property. Um, and so, water infrastructure, um, time to get to those pastures. Um, there are a lot of constraints that we have to consider. Um, you know, we certainly don't have water lines ran to all these different areas at, at certain points. And so um, there's, you know, various aspects of challenges with water, but what I guess, we you know, in terms of conventional beef systems, we are a family farm. We're still family owned and operated, but we are, um, of course, our family's not really in, involved in the day-to-day -day labor aspects of our beef business. So labor is our biggest cost. Um, we're in one of the toughest labor markets in part of Western North Carolina. And so anytime our people are spending time doing something, we've got to understand the ROI of that labor expense. And for us, um, actually with the help of Gallagher and Josh a few years ago, really set out on understanding how much we were spending watering cattle, how much productivity loss we were experiencing with our cattle because of water proximity and you know, amount of waters per pasture, pasture systems. And, and we quickly learned that we were, um, the implementation of a little more uh, advanced watering systems really had a, a really strong ROI for us that we could really make sense in terms of what our labor cost was. And there's so many ways we can look at watering systems, the economics of it, the cow comfort aspects of it. Um, and so we, you know, we, we set out on this kind of this journey to really understand that and really understand the economics of what we were doing. So do you want to talk a little bit more, you know, you said you looked into advanced watering systems. So how did that look different from what you were doing before now that you've made those changes? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, previously, like I said, we had a lot of cattle on the periphery of this property. Um, and our property can take, um, you know, as much as an hour to drive across um, while staying on the property because of the way the uh, property is set up. And we have a, one of the largest rivers um, in this part of the a part of North America that runs right through the middle of our property. So we have one bridge. So if you're, <laughs> you can need to be right across the river and have to go all the way around um, the part of the property. But um, we uh, had previously been using tank waters that we were filling up with a water truck um, daily, twice daily, depending on the system. Um, and then, you know, we're in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Winters are certainly not near as harsh as you all ex experience in the, the West, but still, you know, have certain decent amounts of period of freezing weather, you know, where we won't get above freezing for seven, 10 days at a time. 
um, in the worst part of winter. And so the winter time we were spending an amount of immense amount of time, uh, you know, busting water buckets, tanks, trying to keep the uh, you know those waters um, access get those cows access to water. And so when we really did the math, we were we had around two positions that worked for us that were watering cattle. Um, you know, and that's whether that meant taking tanks to waters, whether it meant busting waters, whatever that meant. There were two two full time positions that that's all they did was water cattle. And I don't know if anyone else experiences what I experienced, but labor is not getting any cheaper. And so we um, you know, really started looking at the math of putting the, putting in these um, you know Mirko Mirfounts, um, and it quickly turned out to be one of the best ROIs we've done in our program. Um, and there were several considerations, not just the labor efficiency, but the cow comfort or how we could form grazing systems that made a lot more sense. Um, and um, a lot of aspects um, that have really, in the last two and a half years, I think, Josh, you might know better than I, I think we put in 37 uh, mirror founts. Um, and, um, and so now we have, uh, we, we don't have a water truck anymore. We don't, um, we depend completely on those, uh, the Mirco products to deliver water to the cattle. And, um, you know, we don't have to bust waters as uh, Josh, I'm sure can give you a lot more specification, but, you know, those, those uh, waters don't withstand our conditions and, um, um, you know, uh, it's just saved immensely on labor. It's saved immensely um, on what we can allocate our, our team members to spend their time doing um, and has really increased our cow comfort, really increased our cow productivity leaps and bounds. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a win from every vantage point we've looked at. Um, well, that's exciting to hear. So Josh, would you go into a little bit more detail um, about how those fountains work and how they're a little different and more efficient? Yeah, <clears throat> so there are energy free and energy efficient uh, models. In our neck, mine and Kyle neck of the woods, we primarily use the energy free. We don't have uh, harsh enough winters for most folks to utilize heaters really at all and Kyle only being an hour and a half from me, he's quite a bit colder during the winter than I am uh, being in the mountains. But um, basically all it is is a tank built up with four inches of insulation, rockite material on the outside. And it's just a valve, simple valve system on the inside that operates once the water declines, the valve opens up and fills it back up. Um, and the Mirco tanks utilize a ball system that pop, pops out of the hole. So the cattle know that there's water in there. You know, as a producer, there's water in there. That's a, an advantage of a ball system, as you can see from a distance, that there is water in the tank. So that's one of those quality of life factors I was talking about earlier is that, you know, from a distance, don't have to physically walk out to the tank that there is water there. Um, but as long, and Kyle said something that he does not have to deal with um, his freezing up, but I should point out that you should consider the number of animals on one tank at a time, if or if you're planning on pulling animals out of a paddock. Um, you do need to have appropriate numbers on the tank, depending on the size of the tank. We've got them 33 gallons, 10 gallons, 70 gallons. But you do need to have the appropriate amount of animals on that tank to keep the water moving through it so it doesn't freeze up in sustained low temperatures, um, which we don't deal with a lot in our territory, but you would more so your neck of the woods but they run on a water line that runs below the frost line, ran out to each individual tank. Then it comes up through a four inch pipe inside of the tank that is surrounded by water, which greatly reduces the chances of freezing. So it's, it's very simple. Well, that's, a, that's exciting to hear how well it, it works in your part of the country. Now the energy efficient one that is a little more resistant to the heat has you had producers have good luck with that in the colder climates? Yes, absolutely. So they'll they'll run on a little, a low level heater that would stay in the tanks during sustained low temperatures. You wouldn't need to keep it on all the time, but sustained low temperatures, keep it on and it's gonna keep your water from freezing. And with your cattle mixing in and out of there, have no trouble at all. Um, to speak to you specifically, we've had several feedlots in that neck of the woods that have moved to the tanks in the last couple of years because Water, um, saving water has become more of an issue within our society and today. So we've had more and more feedlots move in that direction. They're having great luck with it versus the continuous flow that's always been used in those operations. Well, that's nice to hear. So, you know, you've both hit on quality of life 
for the producer and quality of life for the animal with fresh water and saving time and that ROI. Are there other benefits that producers are seeing from implementing these fountains? Yeah, absolutely. They, it, it, depending on their operation, um, they can greatly expand what they're doing with their grazing plan or their grazing management plan. In our neck of the woods over here, a lot of people are uh, utilizing NRCS and USDA programs to fence out their streams and creeks and move to this system, which cleans up our water quality as well as provides cattle greater proximity to water and reduces parasites um, on your animals as well without them drinking out of bodies of water and drinking out of these tanks instead. Well, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So these tanks, um, are they set for cattle can drink out of two sides or what does kind of geometrically, if someone's trying to visualize it, what does that look like? Yes, ma'am. Depending on the size of operation, we can get a one ball and we can do double sided. We can do up to six balls, which would be on three balls on each side. Um, so yep, depending on the size of operation, um, it's gonna depend on how many balls you got. If you're gonna split a fence, obviously you're gonna want balls on both sides. If you're splitting paddocks, um, if you're just wanting it in a small couple acre lot, one ball would be sufficient, two ball, would, it really just depends on your operation and what your plans are for that operation. Okay, so Kyle, I've got another question for you. What was the reaction to your employees once you upgraded this watering system? How did they take it, the people who were out there day to day handling this? Yeah, so it's, um, you know, uh, certainly very positive feedback as we were, um, I guess the only negative feedback is they wanted to do it quicker. <laughs> we, we were putting in a lot of waters across a lot of property. Uh, it was a two-year process for us to, to make that happen. So once they had the taste of freedom, <laughs> they, they, uh, they didn't, they, they hated to have to water anything. And so, especially in the winter, I mean, you know, it's, um, yeah, you know, Shay, you have no doubt worst winter that we're, we're, you know, we just complain out here, but, uh, you know, in the winter, it, it's harsh, you know, it's harsh conditions to be out there busting waters. Our team immensely cares about the, the, the cattle they care for. They want them to have access to water. And I, we don't have to go through all the benefits of why we need water for cattle and, and have that access, you know, more than just a couple points during the day. Um, and so they care about what they do. And so spending that time uh, in a different way where we, that's a check off the list already. That was a pretty rewarding feeling, you know. We we you know to Josh's uh, discussion about different types of mirror founts that are available. We have I don't know if we have every one that they make, Josh, but we have several different kinds. Quite a few, yeah. yeah several <laughs> several different skews of that of that that product. We've got some of the six balls where we have divided fence. We have some of the uh, energy efficients that do have heaters. Um, we do have you know a little bit of everything. So um, you know what I think what my team and um, has found, you know, there, anytime you implement change, there's a little hesitation because our conventional water systems, you know, I say they're easy to work on. They're really, they're pretty simple that they're, they just water flows through them or we fill them up with a tank. There was a little concern of how complicated are these things going to be, um, you know, that sort of aspect. But we found that these things, you know, I'm in no way a plumber and I fix mirror fouls frequently in my role. And so it's something, um, you know, that and by fixing, I say we have one overflowing or something like that. But sorry, Josh, I didn't mean it. Say we were fixing it. You're actually out fixing something, Kyle. I don't... <laughs> I'll tell them to get a picture next time. So you, can see. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when we have to control the flat flow and the valves on them and stuff, they're, they're incredibly simple uh, to operate. And so that's been, um, you know, certainly well received. They're, they're not complicated uh, pieces of equipment to fix. They're very simple in their design um, and, and very user producer friendly. Uh, you know, so that's, that's been, you know, that's, that's certainly one of the big advantages for us because anytime you, you know, we have um, a big property with a lot of different departments, you know, water lines being hit for different air, you know, different reasons and stuff like that. So it's nice to be able to um, be able to get those flows figured out really quick and train every team member, not just have a couple of team members that know how to do it. So um, that's been, and, and, you know, that's been really rewarding for us. Well, Kyle, I have two things to kind of say back to you. One, yep. yes, our winters are harsher, but I can tell you right now, I am an absolute wimp when it comes to heat and humidity. So oh. it's there, there are two sides to that story. But 
Uh, I, I'm ready to move in your direction after the last couple of weeks we've had here. So. <laughs> but also kind of getting back to the main point of the conversation, I appreciate you saying that they're easy to fix because that's something that we see, you know, ranchers have to be jacks of all trades. I mean, even if they have hired men or whatever it may be, like, yet they're not just managing the genetics or managing the grazing. They're the electrician, the plumber. They have to be able to do a lot of things at any given point. And it's nice to be able to fix things yourself and simply because, you know, we hope everything runs smoothly, but odds are something's going to break or need to be updated at some point. So I appreciate you saying that. You know, as we move forward with this, do either of you have anything else you'd like to add about watering systems today for those listening? I, I, Josh, I, if you want to go, I, the one thing I think um, that I maybe haven't hinted on a lot for us, but, you know, in our neck of the woods, obviously, forage utilization is um, probably the highest priority because obviously land resources are the, I say labor is the most costly, but I work on a property that we've owned for 125 years. Um, so we're not having to acquire land, lands available to us because it, we've had it for a while, but certainly utilizing that land in the most efficient way, getting the greatest yield and utilization of our forage is certainly front and center and top of mind. And, and that's, I think, the other big win that we've had with the, the implementation of these watering systems is being able to create gra grazing systems that increase our forage utilization, where um, in the past we had one large tract of land that was you know, considered one pasture. We may have had one water tank at the fence because that's where the guys could fill up a water tank at. Um, and now that water tank is two water tanks and they exist in the middle of those pastures. Um, you know, the cattle are, we're mimicking the cattle's behavior. They're going to the water, they're going back to shade in the summer and in between is where their forage is. And we've seen as much as a 30 to 40% increase in forage utilization to where we were really trampling, stomping that, that forage that was the furthest distance from those water tanks was never really getting traveled to because the cattle were just too heat stressed to, for whatever reason, it's just too far out of their, um, their path. And so now we're able to capture a lot of that forage utilization. Obviously we're, we're doing management intensive grazing here that um, you know, we're keeping those cattle um, in a pretty um, uh, intensive system in terms of how we graze them, but um, that forage utilization and those water systems have made that possible. So. Well, thank you. Josh, do you have anything else to add before we wrap up today? I was going to touch back on him talking about the how easy they are to use and easy to work on if there is a problem. And, you know, I would encourage producers, farmers, ranchers, that if it is a little intimidating to them to reach out to somebody like me that is a professional. I mean, me and Kyle talk, I have his team, most of his team's number. They'll text me questions, text me, you know, what do they need and that sort of thing. But I'd encourage um, folks out there that aren't sure or intimidated to reach out to either uh, a rep like me or a territory manager like me or a producer like Kyle that has experience with these and just ask questions because they really are simple and if you're looking for something to improve your operation um, it, it's not as hard as you may think it is so well awesome thank you very much and I'm sure well I know there's information on this on the Gallagher website and so I will be sure to include that in the show notes and the social media links so thank you both for joining the show today I appreciated hearing your experience and uh, insight when it comes to watering systems absolutely thank you thank you Shay and that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.